If we want to have the word, the God speak, then we should go to where God has spoken, don't you think? And so today, if you don't mind, I would like to spend some time in the Word, in the Word of God. Let us begin um, in uh, Luke chapter 16. We're going to do some reverse engineering today, uh, because sometimes the punchline is at the end, and if we understand that punchline, we can get a better perspective on what Christ is actually trying to teach. And so let's start with Luke chapter 15, sorry, 16, and we're going to start with the end of that, verse 31. Okay, and but Abraham said, and I'm reading from, the, uh, from a different translation, but Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Okay, so this is a topic that Jesus is dealing with that is so, what can we say, uh, entrenched, ingrained, so difficult to overcome, so almost impossible that, that there's almost no solution for this problem that he's dealing with. Huh? It just No, this, this is actually... Um, with the, and this is, okay, the, tech, the context for this statement is in the, we can find it in verse a little bit earlier, and um, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus there lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. So not a pretty picture. So um, we see a situation where one man is comfortable. He eats whatever he wants, dresses in whatever he wants to wear. And another man is poor to the point of having sores all over his body. He probably has malnutrition. He can't fight off the fleas or whatever that is attacking him and these are becoming sores and, and he is in a diseased state and he longs to have a little bit of what the rich man has. And the rich man continues in that state. He maybe passes him every day. Maybe he doesn't see them. Maybe he is in a different block, maybe one block over. But it says that it, it, he lays at his gate. So the, this poor man is lay, laying at the gate of the rich man. The rich man evidently would have the means to solve this man's problem because all the man is looking for is crumbs off of the rich man's table. He's not looking for the rich man's house. He's not looking for the rich man's family. He's not looking for the rich man's bed. He's looking for some crumbs off of his table. And the rich man apparently does not provide that. And verse 22, finally the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham and the, at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died. Okay, so the poor man who was suffering ended up in heaven. Okay, and the rich man also died and was buried and he went to the place of the dead there in torment. Okay, so the rich man ended up in hell. Okay, now I know that we as Adventists, we don't believe in eternal hellfire. And I absolutely believe that that's what the Bible teaches, that there is no eternal hellfire, that there is hellfire though. <laughs> and I think sometimes we're so afraid of the concept of eternal hellfire that we forget that there really is a hellfire. You know, it may not last forever, but how long is too long? Like half a second, in my mind, would be too long to... <laughs> be burning in fire. It's not, I mean, I've burned, and all of us have burned, felt a burning, you know, we've burned our finger on the stove. It's not fun. So there is a hell to avoid. There is a place that is coming, um, and I don't want to be there. And I think that hell probably is not just the physical pain. I'm sure it's not just the physical pain. It's that heart 
pain of knowing that I could have avoided this. I could have been there. Why? Why did I choose this? And then that separation from life, that, that separate. I mean, we, we, we experience the presence of God all the time. A lot of times we don't recognize it. But when that spirit begins to be removed, oh my goodness. You start wondering, what is wrong? What is going on? What is? And so that presence of God is always there, no matter where you are. Even if, if you're in the country, if you're in the jungle, uh, if your boot gets stuck in the mud, or if you're in the cities, big cities where all you see is man-made skyscrapers and, and people running for money and stuff like that. God is there. His spirit is there, wherever we are. But, but that, that hell to be avoided. So this man, the rich man, ends up in hell. The poor man who suffered in this life ends up in heaven. Okay, now this is Jesus' story, not mine, so don't blame me for this, okay? <laughs> the rich man, okay, he went to the place of the dead, verse 23. There in torment he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So the rich man, and, and I believe this is allegorical, but the rich man is saying, hey, what happened? You know, what, what's he doing over there? And he shouted, have some pity, send Lazarus to, to put some water on my, on my tongue and cool my anguish. But Abraham said to, the, to him, now this is something, it's incredibly serious. I think it's incredibly serious. Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. So what happened? What happened? There is a bit of a trading places situation, huh? The man, the man that was, that was taking care of himself suddenly traded places with the man that was in, in anguish. And the man that was in anguish was being comforted. So what's Jesus saying here? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is saying that there is a reward in this life and there is a reward in the next life. And what we do in this life has a huge impact with how we will spend the next life. Whether it will be long and, and comforting or short and very anguishing. Very anguishing. And, and who got that reward? Who got the good reward? Beggars. Yeah, the beggar. The poor man. And if we do a whole study on what Jesus says about the prostitutes and the poor and the suffering versus the church people, we don't stand in a very good company. We're, we're on dangerous ground. What does he say? The prostitutes and the sinners go into the kingdom before you? I mean, if we went back to Jesus' time and we had to choose our company, between a good, upstanding Jewish man who followed all the rules and didn't eat any pork versus a prostitute and a sinner, who would we hang out with? We'd hang out with these guys. But who would go into the kingdom of heaven first? These guys. That's scary. And when I first started studying this, I'm like, well, what's the point of going to church? You know? There is no advantage in salvation for going to church. In fact, there's danger in going to church. Why? Paul succinctly says it when he says, knowledge puffeth up. Our knowledge of the Bible, our knowledge of Christ, makes us proud. And that pride blocks Jesus from actually working in our lives. It goes on to say, but charity edifieth, which means doing good works keeps us humble and builds us up in the faith. And the scary thing is that we feel good about coming to church every Sabbath, coming to church every Sabbath and reading our Bible and getting more knowledge. We want to hear another sermon, learn a little bit more about Christ, and that's good. But if that's all we have, oh my goodness, where does that put us? Where does that put us? Okay. 
if we neglect these good works, if we neglect the good works, I mean, what is Christ really, really, really wanting? What is the fruit that he's hoping for from his church? Is he hoping that we'll have a lot of people that, that have a lot of head knowledge? Or is he looking for a people that care? That care. Yeah, obviously we need the knowledge. We need that saving knowledge. That's how we're saved. And that's how we can give other people light and knowledge. But if we take, if we take faith, if we put faith in our knowledge, then it's, then it's, then it's vain. We've got to put faith in Christ. We've got to put faith in Christ. So the rich man said, okay, verse 25, but Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating between us and you can't come here and we can't go there. So the rich man said, verse 27, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. Now, what do you think this rich man would say to his brothers if he could go to them himself? You think he would say, dudes, you guys are living a really good life, but let me tell you what's around the corner. Let me tell you just a little what, what's up ahead. Maybe you'll change your life. And what kind of change do you think he would say for them to do? Would he say, you know, go get more money. <laughs> go try a different pair of clothes, you know. Try eating uh, mangoes. No, he would say, spend a little time with that Lazarus guy, you know. If he said, if his message was trade places with that Lazarus guy, put him in your bed, give him your food, give him your clothes, you lay at the gate and let the dogs lick your sores for the next 20 years, I don't know how old they were, 20 years, 30 years, would that be a wise thing to do? Absolutely. That would be a really wise thing to do because, I mean, like, let's say you're, you suffer for 20 years, but in the end, you get eternal life. How long is eternal life? It's long. It's longer than 20 years, and it's better than any reward that we can get in this life. And so it would make sense for, for the rich man to say, go back to my brothers and tell them to trade places with that guy. If not trade places with him, at least elevate him to where you are. Give him what you have. Make him equal with you. Share, share with him everything that you have so that we can go to the same place together. But what if they, they went back and they made him like they were to ignore the rest of the poor in the city? They'd all end up in the place of anguish. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. So your brothers can read what Moses and the prophets have wrote. So in other words, his brothers had the warning already. In the Bible, there is enough warning about what was going to take place. And the rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham says, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So something, this, this thing about um, the rich man enjoying his, his life, enjoying his clothes, enjoying everything, the way life goes, there's something about the power of that kind of life that is so strong that even if someone rose from the dead to warn, they would not be willing or be able to give it up or even recognize that. 
That is the issue that is so powerful. It gets a grip on our lives. It gets a grip on our brains. It gets a grip on our, on, our, on our hopes and our dreams and everything about us. It gets a grip on our church and says, this is the way it has to be. And I can't change. We can't, can't change. How many people do you know that have given up this life to become a beggar on the streets of Mumbai, for instance? How many people think that would be easy? That would be hard. That would be incredibly hard. Impossible. Unless Christ does that work. But let's think about, let's compare the rich man and Lazarus and their apparent statuses or elevations in society. The, the, the Lazarus was down here and the rich man was up here. Okay? Now compare, compare the distance between them and the distance between him and Christ. You know, how far did Christ has to have to come down just to become a man? And then he didn't become just a man. He came all the way down to becoming worse than a beggar, to be hung and, and tried and, and crucified as a criminal. Oh, heaven, help our pride, our foolish pride that says that we're better than them and we don't, and that this life that we've been given is something we deserve. Wow. And I know a lot of my friends would say, I deserve this because I worked for it. I can show you a lot of people that work a lot harder in other countries. They're not half, not nearly, just don't have the opportunities. They don't have the opportunities. And not just a physical point, but on a spiritual point, they don't have the spiritual opportunities to learn about this thing that we take for granted called hope. You know, if something bad happens to us, then that's okay. This life is temporary. Jesus is coming soon. Life will be better then. What if they don't have that opportunity? Isn't that something that, that, that is even more important to share than, than, than the physical blessings? So let's keep going with this. The reverse engineer this passage. Okay, let's go back. That was the last parable. If you look at this whole thing, what Jesus is talking about, this is the end of a, of a talk that began at the beginning of Luke 15. So all of Luke 15 and all of Luke 16 is the same teaching. Okay? And we're going to go back a little bit to the beginning of Luke 16, okay? This was a parable. You know it very well. A certain rich man had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came, as verse 1, that the manager was wasting his employees' money. Now, how does a manager waste his employer's money? Most likely he was embezzling. He was taking his manager's money and using it for um, his boss's money and using it for himself. Um, that's usually grounds for... Uh, dismissal. So the employer called him in and said, what's this here? I hear? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. Verse 3, the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he calls his the debtors to his, his boss and starts, you know, cutting their debt in half or a third or just giving them this massive discount and in hopes that the debtors will appreciate him for their good favor towards them. And the rich man, verse 8, had to admire this dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. <laughs> so how was he being shrewd? He was thinking ahead. He was looking to this next station in life and saying, how can I prepare for that station in my, when the next chapter in my life? How can I prepare for that? And Jesus says, it is true, second half of verse 8, it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Whoa. So in other words, he says that this kind of planning doesn't often happen in fact, it rarely happens in the children that are following God. The believers, 
that believe in God don't often do this kind of planning. It's called uh, retirement planning, <laughs> you know, uh, long-term investment. Here's the lesson, verse 9, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Okay, what kind of friends was he talking about making? Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. So what kind of friends is this? It's the kind of friends that will be in heaven. Okay, it's the kind of friends that you introduce to Jesus. So use your money, use your earthly wealth to introduce people to Jesus so that they will welcome you into heavenly home. Now, if you don't use your money to, and this, is, this ties in with Lazarus and the rich man. If the rich man had spent a little bit of his money to take care of Lazarus, he probably, according to that simple allegory, wouldn't have ended up in the place of torment. But Lazarus would become a friend and of course, Lazarus was, oh, you helped me. Come on in. Now, Mrs. White makes another application with this. She says that the angels are working to elevate men and women, elevate humanity. And as we enter into that work, they become our friends, our co-laborers. Our angels <laughs> become co-laborers. And so they're the ones that welcome us into heaven. But if we don't do that kind of work, then they will say, I never knew you. Now you may be thinking, well, is this works? You know, are we working our way into heaven? True religion is not works, but true religion works. <laughs> you know, all, what Christ is asking us to do is nothing more than he did. And what did he do? He said, of mine own self, or any, I can do, Nothing. So if I rely on what's coming out of my own self, there is nothing there to do anything good. So he was completely dependent upon the Father. Is that works? Are we going to blame the Father in heaven for salvation by works? God's do if God's doing all the works, are we going to level with him you know, you're a legalist because you're working and you're doing all these activities? No. This is, what we were, this is what we were designed to do. This is what we were created to do. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. We're designed for good works. That is our destiny. That is our, you know, people say, I've got to go out and find myself. That's our full, that's our that's where we will find ourselves, is in we give ourselves away to, in Christ for good works. And we all like good works. I'm sad that good works has gotten a bad rap. I like good works. You know, when my wife wakes up in the morning and smiles at me, that's a good work. <laughs> I like that. When, you know, we get done with our meetings here at noon and we go over there and there's going to be food there, that's a good work. I like that. We all like that. If it's not there, that's a bad work. That's no works. We don't like that. Okay? So good works is a good thing. It blesses others, and we are blessed in the doing of it. So if you, okay, then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. You think that's worth it? Absolutely. If this is, he goes on, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. Okay, so what is he talking about? What is he identifying as little things? Okay. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest in greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy worthy about worldly wealth. Okay, so what is Jesus calling little things? Yes, worldly wealth. Because he's making, okay, if you're, let's see, uh, 10 faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest in greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth. So he's calling worldly wealth a little thing. That's not the way we see it. 
the world sees worldly wealth as the thing, the big thing. And Jesus is calling that a little thing. In fact, it's kind of interesting. We visited the White Temple in northern Thailand uh, with Mission Trek just a year and a half ago. And the temple is just amazingly ornate, probably the mo most ornate building I've ever seen. And it depicts heaven and how to get there. Um, and then it's all white uh, with uh, reflective little uh, mirrors, little pieces of mirrors, so it sparkles and white in the sun. And then he wanted to show the, the worth of worldly wealth, and so he made the bathrooms gold. <laughs> so you go to the bathrooms, everything's gold, and he's saying, this is worldly wealth. This is the worth of worldly wealth. And uh, I think he's on to something. Okay. If you are untrustworthy, un verse 11, if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? So there is something in the future that is going to be better than money, that is more worthy than money. And check this out. And if you're not faithful with other people's things, okay, so he's, he's still got this comparison going on. Little things, um, worldly wealth, other people's things. So all the wealth, and if you study this out in the Bible and Mrs. White's writings, it's very clear that everything that we own, all of our worldly wealth, isn't really ours. It's a gift to us. It's a test. It's a test for us whether we will be faithful with that. In other words, will we use it for the master? Or will we use it for ourselves? If we use our money, if we consider our money, I'm sorry to say this because I know it's stepping on a lot of toes. This is the heart. You know, God doesn't, God doesn't need our, our money. He, needs, he wants our heart. But our hearts are so tied up in our money that he asks for our money so he can get to our heart. This is a hard issue. Why is it such a hard issue? Because we receive the good things in life through money. We receive our food. You don't have any money, you can't buy food. We receive our clothes. You don't have any money, you can't buy clothes. A lot of things we get through money. And I used to think, why in the world was it such a temptation for the Israelites to worship a cow? Until I started to realize, from the cow they got their food. From the cow they got their clothes. You worship what you get your sustenance from. And so that is why our money is such an idol to us. Because we see that the money is the source of our food, clothes, happiness. And so we arrange our lives around the money. And that's short-sighted because it's really God's money. And if we go to Matthew 6.31, Matthew 6.31 says, you know this passage very well. So do not worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? And I know a lot of my friends will say, well, if I don't worry about it, who will? Verse 32, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your, who? Heavenly Father knows all your needs. He knows you need those things. And I used to tell the story, you know, if my, my son, like, he's, let's say he's four years old, my little son, you know, little, little guy, he comes up to me, Daddy, I got to go get a job. Why do you need a job? Because I'm not sure you're going to feed me tomorrow. <laughs> we would laugh. We are laughing about that. It's a ludicrous concept. Of course I'm going to feed him. I brought him into this world. I love the kid. Now, don't we treat our father that way? Say, God, I'm going to go get a job because I'm not sure if you're going to feed me tomorrow. And the father says, oh. So check this out. This is Jesus talking. This is not me. <laughs> These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Now, if we gauged our faith on, on how much we focus on our job and to earn money so that we can have food and clothing, if we judge our faith by that, how much of a believer would we actually be? 
let's say, I mean, it's one thing to say that on a, on a, on a Sabbath morning, but well, let's say Monday morning when you clock in, why are you there? Is it because I have faith in God's going to take care of me? Or is it because I got to put food on the table? Because I don't think he's going to do that. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So therefore, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom's welfare. Seek the kingdom's growth. Seek all that stuff for the kingdom. And all these things will be added unto you. That's life, man. That's where life is at. The experience of God. We've had people come to faith camp, and uh, you, they were here a couple years ago, the, the um, Tencanos. You remember the Tencanos? Maybe some of you have, haven't met them. They, uh, we did a faith camp uh, January, uh, end of January 10, 2011. Yeah, 2011. And um, they were a very wealthy, very wealthy couple. Um, the Lord had directed them to get married. She didn't think he was very wealthy, only had a couple million. Um, he f hit his first million at the age of 27. Um, elder in the church, drinking and partying Friday night, go to church Sabbath morning, <laughs> realized that his family was falling apart. There was tension. He didn't know how to handle that. And he was driving his big, expensive Hummer downtown, and he looks over and he sees his family, a little tiny, poor car falling apart. The family was happy. He said, I don't have that. I don't have that happiness. So he put aside his business, focused on seeking the Lord for two years. Sought the Lord, found the Lord, a lot of Ellen White, a lot of Bible. He says, there's still something missing. Came to faith camp, realized it's service. And his wife was sitting in the front row and saying, and she was crying. I didn't know why she was crying, but she says, all these people, they have testimonies of faith in God. They have stories of God coming through for them. I don't have any stories like that. That was 2011. Now, if you hear them speak, they got more stories than any of <laughs> them. Are, they are amazing. They were driving um, one time uh, to, um, to go to an appointment, and he had, you were getting low, you know, family of four, they were actually here in America. They only had like $250 in their pocket, and they saw somebody at the side of the road with, with a problem. They stopped, and, and um, the guy's like, well, you know, I need to fix my car, I need to do this, and, and I, I need $230 to do it. And the guy's like, well, I, don't, I only have $250, so here, here's $100, which to us would be like, that's a huge step of faith. He goes and gets in the car. His wife tells him, where's your faith, man? Go give him the whole amount. So he gets out and gives him the two twenty or whatever. He's got like twenty, thirty dollars left in his pocket, and he's the Lord provided. It was a miracle. In fact, that time that they were driving here to Faith Camp a few years ago, he has a picture of this. They were driving on Highway 90, I believe, and um, and there's a big hailstorm with hail this, like this big, big massive things. And so the radio emergency signal came on and said, if you're on the road, get under a bridge, get under, you know, find shelter. And uh, they're like, you know what? We got to be there. We have an appointment. This is a God-ordained appointment. We're just going to go. And they just, and they took a picture. And you can see this massive cloud. And it's hailing like crazy here and hailing like crazy there. And the road in front of them is wide open. <laughs> Praise the Lord. These are the experiences that God is calling us into. It's not because they're special. It's not because they're different. It's because this is what they wanted. They wanted this. And this is what, you know, Paul in Acts, I don't have the verse right now. He's, he's talking about the, the Jews that came against them and, and, uh, and, and, and stirred up envy against them. He says these you know, the gospel should go to you first, but now it's going to other people because you are not worthy to receive the gospel. Why? What made them unworthy? It was the fact that they didn't want it. So how do we become worthy of the kingdom? Simply wanting it. That man out there, you know, plowing in the field and he found this huge treasure. He wanted that treasure. He wanted it. And because he wanted it, he with joy went and sold everything else that he had. And everybody thought he was crazy. 
And he ended up the richest man in town. <laughs> and I see this happening over and over again. People hear the call. They don't think that they have anything. They don't think they have anything to offer. They say, Lord, we're, we don't have a degree. We don't have money. But I'm willing. The Lord says, that's good. Let's start something. Let's go do something. And now they come back with these amazing stories. Amazing stories. They're doing stuff. I've come up with a new motto for Jesus for Asia. For me. Not for me personally. Not for my wife. Because she's good. For me, my motto is that I enable people better than myself to do what God has called them to do. Because, you know, I've been, I've been um, uh, what's the word, converted for over 20 years now. I'm still a sinner. I think that last 20 years of being, of being in God's grace, ha- the main outcome of that is to expose my uh, depraved, how depraved I am. How depraved my nature really is. I didn't know the depths of my evil. I still don't know it. I'm glad God doesn't reveal it all at once. But there's times, you know, I'm like, Lord, don't use me. I'm, I have envy. I have iniquity. I have jealousy. I have all kinds of, all these evil things, you know, coursing through my veins. And, and the Lord says, yeah, I know. Let's go to work now. Because <laughs> it's not us. It's him. And, and like John Newton says, you know, my, I am a great sinner, but I serve So the more I see of my depravity, the more beauty I see in Christ. And he is able. He is able. And so this issue of the comfortable life, of the money, of the the wealth of this life is so powerful over us. It is so pow- it's got such a grip on us that even if somebody rose from the dead and told us our danger, we would not change. So where's our hope? Hope is in the word. It's right here. With man, it is impossible. You know, it's more, it's more impossible for a rich man, which includes pretty much all of us. We, how, many, how many had to walk here? Or did you were able to take a car? And it might be your own car. OK, so we're doing pretty good. <laughs> um, so it's more, it's more difficult for us to enter the kingdom of God, but it's very difficult for us to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because we find salvation and comfort and strength and life in our, in our resources, in our funding. And this is what Christ is trying to deal with. Now, let's step back another step. Now, remember, we're reverse engineering this whole thing. Now we can look at the parable before this, which was the prodigal son is actually not so much the prodigal son. It was a parable for the prodigal son's elder brother, which he was saying to the Jews. The Jews, the church people in that day, um, occupied the place of the elder brother because they were saying, we follow God. The younger brother, the prodigal son, said, I don't want anything to do with God. I want to go out in the world because it looks more fun out there. And he came to his senses, came back, went to confess. The father hardly even heard his confession, reinstated him into the family, gave him the credit card, family credit card, the family authority, says, you're back, you are my son. Not because you've done good, because you are my son. And then the elder brother was angry. We're going to look at this. This is just incredible. This is so incredible. Okay, Luke chapter 15 Uh, We're going to start with verse 28. The older brother was angry and would not go in. Now his father could have said, okay, forget that elder brother. You know, he's just got a bad attitude. But no, he goes out and he talks to to the elder brother. And the elder brother said, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. Okay, now right off the bat, does the elder brother have a correct picture of the character of the father no so he was living in the same house 
on the same property, serving the father, had no idea who the father really was. No clue. Okay? In all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. And as soon as this, year, this worthless other brother of mine, who spent half your money, half your wealth on riotous living, comes back, you kill the fatted goat and you throw a big party. You never did that for me. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything, everything I have is yours. Whoa. That's crazy. Everything I have is yours. Do you think that elder brother had to go for all those years without a party? No. <laughs> he could have had a party every single night of his life. But he didn't because he thought he didn't understand the father. He didn't understand the father's heart. Now, if you look at the father, here's a father who this rascal of a son, the younger brother, came and says, Dad, I want my money. You know, he would, he's like, he's so disrespectful. You know, it, it, you don't give the inheritance until the father dies. So the son is, in effect, saying, I'd, I'd rather wish you were dead to the father. You know, I want your money. I don't want you. The father could have said, no, that's not the way it's done around here. What did the father do? Is the father selfish or generous? <laughs> generous to a fault. And he's so wealthy, he can give away half his wealth and it didn't seem to phase him. You know, that's a lot of money. Now, this obviously, the father in this parable represents our father in heaven. And this saying is our father talking to us. The God of the universe is looking at each one of us and says, all that I have That's a lot. That's... <laughs> How much does God have? Let's see, he's probably got a 20 on him, maybe a $100 bill in his back pocket, maybe a universe, maybe all the gold in all the world and all the other worlds, all the resources of the entire universe, all the angels at his service, He's got all that, and all that, and here we are trying to go earn a little bit of bread, trying to go earn a little bit of clothing. And he's like, you poor kids, you have no clue. Here we're spending all this time with the Father, we're, 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 we're saying we're the Father's kids, and, and we have no clue what he's like. What if that elder brother before the younger son came home, he was out working in the field and he's thinking about it. He says, wait a minute, my father gave half of his inheritance. Wait a minute, that's my money. You know, he's thinking that was my money and he's getting angry and angrier. But what if he thought, wait a minute, how come my father's not angry for giving all that to my brother? In fact, I wonder where he's at. So he goes into the, into the house. I can imagine it's a big farm spread, uh, maybe out in Nebraska. <laughs> and uh, there's the, the home, you know, the main home. It's a big home, kind of a rambling thing. And he goes into the house, and, and one of the servants is there. He says, hey, where's my dad? Oh, he's out on the front porch. Okay. So he goes out there. Says, dad, um, I was thinking of having a little get-together with my friends and wondering if I could, uh, you know, have, you know, just like 20 bucks to go buy some, you know, a couple pizzas and stuff like that. What do you think the father would have said? All that I have is yours. Oh, cool. Go down to the store, you know. And the father might have said, you got the credit card. Because this ring thing, you know, back then, that was, that was the seal. That was a sign, sign, like signing your name, you know. So he goes into the shop. He says, yeah, I'd like some pizza. Maybe at that time, he says, I'd, I'd like that little goat over there. <laughs> Okay, you got the money? Well, I've got this. Oh, you're his son. No problem. Just, you know, put that press right there. You're good. Take the goat. So he takes it home, has a little party with his friends. Next day, he goes to his dad. Dad, I had a, you know, 
I had a great time last night. Thanks. Good, good. Glad you had a good time. You think I could have one again next week? All that I have is yours. And then does that several times. And he's like, Dad, would you like to come to the party? Yeah, sure. So he comes. Have a great time. The next day he comes out on the porch. Dad, why are you always out here on the porch? I'm waiting for your brother. Serious? He took half your money. I don't care. I miss him. I'm hoping one day he's going to be coming down that driveway. Really, Dad? You love that guy still? Oh, yeah. I give my life for him. Well, if you love him, do you love me? What do you think the father would have said? Yes. Well, if, you, if everything that you own is mine, and you love me that much, that means that I could go looking for my brother and I don't have to be jealous of him. I don't have to like be angry with him because you would do the same for me? Absolutely. Okay. Would you mind sponsoring my trip? <laughs> and the father would say, all that I have is yours. Go. I believe that's the picture of our church today. God, the Father, is saying, all that I have is yours. Look at Brian and Jessica. They had nothing. I think, I don't mind, I don't think Brian would be angry with me telling you this, but he's a high school dropout. And he said, and he realized, God loves lost people. And he loves me. So what are we risking? What are we really giving away? Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Come and follow me. Just before that, he said, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wow. He that abandoneth farms and homes and family and brothers and sisters in this, in this life will have a hundredfold in this life and eternal life. What do, we, what do we stand to lose? Really nothing. What do we stand to gain? Just get to know the Father. Taste and see, for the Lord is good. I asked the angel why there was no more faith and power in Israel. He said, you let go of the arm of the Lord too soon. Press your petitions to the throne and hold on by strong faith. The promises are sure. Believe that you receive the things you ask for and ye shall have them. Believe that you have it and then you'll have it. And of course that believing, that faith, just opens the door for God to work. Mrs. White, you know, this whole concept, I'm going to go back a little bit, this whole concept of, you know, all that I have is yours, it's, it's almost like foreign to us. And, you know, is there any corroboration to that statement? Mrs. White says, and I'm sorry I don't have it up here, she says that if we have renounced self and given ourselves to God, then everything in the Father's house both in this life and in the life to come, whether resources or ministration of angels or even ministrations of, 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 of people against us, will serve to our good. In other words, everything in the Father's house is for us. That's what she says. You know, I used to, I used to, <laughs> I used to drive down the road in my old car, looking over at the new car and thinking, I can't afford that. I'm just a poor missionary. And I'd see this big skyscraper, and I'm like, I can't afford that. I'm just a poor missionary. And, and I look at the road. I mean, how much did it cost to, to build that road? That road out here, Highway 195, how much did that cost? Well, I can't afford that. But then I read this. It's like, okay, that's my road. That's my new car. That's my sky rise. I don't need it right now. 
So God is letting other people manage it. Because can you imagine the headache of running a big skyscraper? Ah, I don't need that right now. But God says it's all yours. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. The promises are sure. Believe ye receive the things you ask for, and ye shall have them. Wow. You know, um, speaking of faith, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, and they came back the next day, and they saw the fig tree withered up, the disciples says, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus said, you can do the same thing. You know, he never told them how to increase their faith. He just said, if you have faith, the seed of a mustard seed. I don't know how it started. It's just you believe something. Believe what God says and step out on it, and that becomes reality. This is another thing. Many of you know this. This is um, Butterfly Paradise. This is an example of faith. Tim Maddox, yeah, we were there last September, uh, October, and I got to walk through it. Uh, Tim is running, uh, about 20 years ago, he invested his life savings into a piece of property near Siem Reap, Cambodia. It uh, cost him about $15,000. And um, he would move forward by faith. If the Lord called him to build a building, if he had $100 towards that building, he would hire the workers and start them working on it. Building maybe $30,000, but he had 100 and the promises of God. And so he would start it building. And as he would build, the money would come in. And so 20 years later, uh, his land is worth, instead of 15,000, it's worth about 15 million. Now it's worth about 20 million because that's a tourist area, Angkor Wat, and a lot of five-star hotels are coming in and all that kind of stuff. And so he's, he says, you know, my land's worth about 15 million. I says, well, why don't you sell your land, build someplace else better for like 2 million, and then you still have 13 million in the bank. And he says, yeah, I thought about that, but I have another idea. Who's reaching all those tourists that are coming through? And so he says, I think God's calling me to build a butterfly aviary, butterfly paradise, butterfly zoo thing, you know? I said, well, how, how much is that going to cost you? He says, I figure about $350,000. I'm like, Tim, you can hardly afford the ten dollars or $11,000 a month that costs you just to run the operation that you have. Like, you know, he's in debt, he's out of debt, he's like, like this. Every month, I'm like, how are you thinking? Why are you even thinking about another $350,000? He says, that's God's problem. I'm like, in my mind, I thought, this guy's crazy. He's gone off the deep end. Faith has overcome him. <laughs> he's, he's been in an unguarded moment of faith, you know, but this is not going to work. But I can't speak doubt into his life, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I just kind of smile. I'm like, yeah, go for it, Tim. We'll, we'll pray for you. <laughs> And um, two months later, I got a call from somebody in Southern California saying, I'm selling my investment property and I want to donate $160,000 to Tim Maddox. And so this, this is there. I mean, it's 120 feet long, 80 feet wide. This happened out of faith. He, he asked the Lord, he says, Lord, can I fundraise for this? This looks like a good project that I can fundraise for. And the Lord said, no, <laughs> that's my problem. Sometimes, like, so he got these guys working, and he ran out of the 160000 and and I thought that they would hold until he got another donate, but he kept moving forward. You know, a lot of work, a lot of man hours to put the, uh, the, the, the plants and all the, the, the wires and the, and the pipes and everything in there. That green part is going to be, uh, they're gonna, it's going to be blue <laughs> later, but it's going to be a fish massage. The fish come up, you put your feet in the, in the water, and the fish come up, and chew the dead skin off your feet. It's actually kind of cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there was the, so he kept the team working even though he didn't have the money. There was a couple times where um, Friday afternoon he, he had to pay his team at, at 5 o'clock and at 3 o'clock he had no money. He owed them like, uh, I don't remember what it was, like $1,000 and he had zero money. And he, he went into his house 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Lord, if you want me to stop uh, building par uh, Butterfly Paradise. I don't have any money. I'm just completely out. Within the next two hours, somebody would come to his door and give him enough money to pay his workers. It happened twice, so he says, okay, God wants this done. So he's just moving forward by faith, you know. Um, again, as Brother Martin says, that first step of faith, make it a small one. Test it. See if this is the way 
he wants us to go. Now remember how the, how the elder brother learned about the father's uh, character. Number one, he thought about it. He started putting the things together. Okay, he gave that money to the younger son. He wasn't angry. He still is hoping that younger son can come home. So he's starting to think and put these things together. If we don't do that, then we will fall into sin. Uh, Psalms 106, 6 and 7. Our forefathers committed iniquity. They did evil and they sinned because they did not, number one, consider the power of God. And number two, his abundant love towards us. So we put those things together. Here is a God of the universe that can do anything. And he loves us. So all that power, all that wealth, all those resources are bound into our lives to overcome the troubles and the challenges that are before us and to give us victory in the, in the battle. So it takes that time and that thinking and that consideration and that willingness to dare. And this is what God is calling us to. Uh, Daniel 11 says um, they go out and do those that understand are wise, go out and do exploits. That's what we need today. We need exploits. We're looking at 40% of the world still has no access to the gospel. You know, somebody says, well, you know, why should I worry about the unreached? I have unreached in my own family. Technically, that's not an unreached. That's an unconverted. But they've had access to the gospel. They've heard the story. They just don't want it. The unreached is somebody that's never had access to the Gospels, never heard the story. So there's 40% of the world, you know, several billion people don't have access to the Gospel. How is this going to happen? How are they going to hear so that Matthew 24, 14 can be fulfilled? I don't know. God knows. And if He can do anything, and if all the resources of the universe are available, all we need is revival. All we need is to walk back into that house and go look for our father. Say, Dad, who am I to you? What are you really like? Are you as selfish as I think you are? Let's see what he says. Let's see what he says. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We just we don't know what to say Father except forgive us forgive us for neglecting you and the amazing promises that you have in your word Father the biggest temptation we have is to go on with life as usual the generations before us did their lives in a normal way. And the biggest, biggest temptation, the biggest challenge that we have is to continue the same. Is to wake up tomorrow and say and think this is the same day as before. But that's exactly what the people in Sodom and thought. That's a, exactly so Father. I don't even know what to ask for. I know that Mrs. White said our greatest need is the revival of primitive godliness. Maybe that is just seeing who you are and who we are to you. And when we start to see who we are to you, we start to relax our grip on the things that we see are securities, but you see are cords that bind us to this earth. Father, this earth is a sinking ship. We recognize that. We don't have the power to change our affections, to put our affections upon you. But we claim the promise that says that you can do anything. And if we just come to you as wicked, as sinful, as self-filled, uh, as blind as we are, if we just come to you, you won't turn us away. You won't cast us out. You have the solution.
we don't have the solution, but you do. So we come to you now, we surrender everything into your hands. We just ask that you will do your will in this earth for your honor, for your glory, which is good, which is noble, and which is desirable. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.